Good morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being on time. Today, we're going to do three things, which you find on the board. First, we're going to continue with the introduction and the analysis of the famous lecture Machiavelli wrote in December 1513 to a dear friend of his, who was also a politician, or you'd better use the word, high-ranking administrator of Florence, a diplomat, depending on the period, Francesco Vettori. We're trying to understand what Machiavelli was trying to achieve with that letter. Then we'll go back to something that was posted earlier, pages from the introduction and an episode from the introduction of Stanley Bean's What Would Machiavelli Do? Finally, we're going to talk about one or more scams or cons and see both for the case of Bob and Mary and also for the scams and the cons that are played routinely in many European cities, whether or not they can be labeled Machiavellian, what is Machiavellian in those practices or behavior. Keep in mind that our second activity, the analysis of Bob and Mary, is related to the kind of work you will be doing with the final paper. And, and I'll provide some hints and then later on we'll spend more time, we'll have a structured segment unit about the paper itself. And the analysis of the cons is related, connected, to your first written assignment, which you find at the end of week three. Okay. And there will be a chance also on Friday to talk about that, review the instructions for the assignment together. So on Monday I talked about this lecture. I tried to put it in a context quickly just to summarize the main things. Machiavelli had a successful career in the administration of Florence. He worked as a secretary. In fact, one of his nicknames is the Florentine secretary. And in that context, when you think of secretary, you have to think of the use that uh, that definition, that name gets inside some administrative institutions or political institutions as well. For example, think of the secretary in the American expression, secretary of state, okay? So secretary means that he is entrusted with what? What is the base word of secretary? Just have to replace one consonant in English to get the base word. And that consonant is different because of Latin. And the spelling of Latin is sometimes slightly different than the modern version. What is the base word of secretary? Take the first syllables. What do you have? What do you get? What do they make you think of? What's an English word? Secret, yes. So, uh, secretary is someone who's entrusted with delicate, secretive letters, and does have power. And Machiavelli worked in two different departments. Among other things, he was responsible for some aspects of the organization and training of the Florentine army. But he also performed several rather delicate diplomatic missions. And we'll talk later about those missions. Later on, as I mentioned, Machiavelli was fired, subject to intense scrutiny to see if there was any malfeasance in his previous employment with the Republic of Florence. Then he was jailed, accused of having plotted to overthrow the Medici government, 
he was subjected to a very painful form of torture at the same time that other prisoners in the same building were routinely executed and he wrote about hearing them scream when they came to take them to be hanged. Eventually though he was cleared to an extent he was uh, set free but confined to his country estate outside of Florence. So there we find Machiavelli in 1515. His own employment is to take care of his farms, of the woods from which he gets wood uh, to sell, dealing with the villagers, and he has a slim channel of communication with the outside world. In the letter he says that he has not been to Florence more than 20 times. And of course he's not supposed to, but control for those kinds of confinements is, is not what it might be today for someone who's sent to house arrest, for example. So he can go to Florence, but it's kind of dangerous, so he limits that as much as possible. And the other channel of communication he has, typical of the time, is to write letters to his friends and acquaintances. Particularly, he cares about maintaining a channel of communication with Vittori, because Vittori, the two of them have been friends. Vittori himself had worked for the Republic of Florence, but during that stint, when Florence was a so-called republic, which means a very elitist kind of democracy where only one or two percent of the male population in the city could vote and be voted, had access to positions. Vittori was not a big player, uh, was not someone who was, who was involved with, with delicate missions, delicate matters. He was a lower level kind of administrator, and after all, even the Medicis couldn't sack, couldn't fire everyone from the previous administration. They needed some expertise, right? So they kept Vittori on. And in fact, they gave him apparently uh, a big promotion because they made him ambassador of the city of Florence in Rome. However, as you find in the correspondence between Machiavelli and Vittori, Vittori complains that, yes, he is the ambassador, he dresses up for public ceremonies, he goes to see the Pope together with other ambassadors. However, the Pope is himself a Medici, a member of the Medici family. However, they don't really want to uh, confide their plans or entrust Vittori with their secrets. And therefore, one of the main tasks of ambassadors during the time to send out reports, to convey information about the state of affairs of another state, in this case, the state of the church, back to their home government, is reduced to the chronicle of those ceremonies. There is nothing major that Florence will communicate to Vittori, or that Vittori has to communicate from the Pope to Florence, because the Pope uses a back channel, a private channel, to communicate with his family in Florence. Okay? They don't want to let Vittori know about their major political plans, alliances, etc. Why is this letter famous? because we find in here the first mention of the prince and how Machiavelli during this period has already begun writing the prince composing this little book. And that will go on at least until 1515 and probably even after 1515 Machiavelli will revise and expand that book that we will soon be reading the other thing is that this letter has some value. Clearly, it's, it's not any kind of typical letter. It's part of a friendly exchange, or you can call it a game. One of them suggests, why don't we describe to each other our typical day? 
and Vittori will do it, Machiavelli will do it, and this is Machiavelli's typical day. It is infused with literature, with literary references. It is written in a style that is not a friendly, casual style, but it is the style of letters written by intellectuals during that period. In fact, oftentimes, you find major intellectuals from the Renaissance who collected their letters to friends and published them. Because that was part of a tradition that you find in ancient Greece, and especially in Rome, whereby Cicero, or later on Seneca, would write letters to friends, but the letter was just a genre where the contents were philosophical, intellectual, reflections about life, or episodes that at literary episodes. And Machiavelli will do that a lot in his letters. So there is literature in here. There is a lot of irony and self-irony at that. However, given the context, there are scholars, including myself, who are convinced that this letter is a kind of resume, an indirect portfolio of anecdotes and examples because after all, in spite of the limited relevance that Vittori has in the new government of Florence, he is still in contact with the Medici family. He still has access to their ears. He can talk to them about Machiavelli. So with that in mind, what would Vittori really be talking about when he relates the various stories, the various activities that keep Machiavelli engaged during this period in a typical day. And therefore, you understand that there is something beneath the text. That if you read this letter, have in mind that this is an indirect biographical resume. So what professional qualities is Machiavelli highlighting every time he talks about something. So that is what I want to focus on. I'll leave the reading of the letter and the details to you and the explanation to the footnotes by Connell in the book, by William J. Connell. And I just want to give you focal points, reading points, things that would allow you to interpret the letter in different ways. And of course, it's an interpretation, right? So it's we're trying to make sense of this rather complex text, which also has sources behind. It's not, as I said, random writing, casual writing. So I put on the board several of the key passages in the letter which correspond to key moments in the day, in the typical day of Machiavelli. And at the beginning of the description of that day, you find a reference to hunting, hunting little birds, to Machiavelli being loaded to the brim with bird traps, right? It's not rich enough to have a hunting party, to have an assistant, to have some kind of staff helping him from, from the farm, helping him carry those birds. If we assume that this is a kind of resume, whereby if Vettori tells the story, someone will understand, not only will hear something possibly funny about Machiavelli or endearing, but will get a sense of the qualities of this man, the human qualities, which also uh, can be considered professional qualities, right? Because after all, this old letter could be understood as, my friend Vettori, I'm giving you material if you ever receive a question such as, what is your friend Machiavelli doing these days? However many episodes you can relate, one or more, they will grasp what kind of a man Machiavelli is and they might get the desire to reconsider 
the employment of Machiavelli. Because after all, these stories would communicate what qualities, what stuff is Machiavelli made of. So, what about hunting? What would be the relevance in this context of that? And I put two thirds to explain that. One is empathy. Because, or I could put sympathy. Because one thing we know about the Medici is that, like other aristocrats, but especially them among all aristocrats of the period, were in love with hunting. To the point where, if you go to Florence, you might find a poster, it's very common, with the 12 Medici villas. This was made at the end of the 1500s, a very nice uh, poster. I have one of those villas framed in, in my bathroom and hangs on the wall of the bathroom downstairs because that is the villa of Monte Vettolini, where, which is the village of my wife. Very small village to this day, about 300 people, and about 40% of the area of the village is occupied by this villa. It sits on top of a hill. There is no strategic importance to that. The place is nice, but it's not nicer than the Florentine hills. Why did they build a villa there? Because if you go down, if you drive down, or if you, if you walk down, within a few miles, you still find a natural park uh, of marshes. And in those marshes, you find plenty of birds. So the very reason they built this villa and visited this villa among the many they had was that they would take their horses or carriages and within a short drive they would have incredible hunting grounds when it came to hunting birds. Big birds, small birds, you find all kinds and since now it is a natural park, the birds have come back and, and there is a nice uh, uh, ecological environment that you find there, Christine. Uh, which villa did you say it was? It's called Monte Vettolini. I, I can write it down if you want, but I think this detail is secondary. And it is now owned by Roman aristocrats, a family called Borghese. But it's a beautiful place. In fact, my wife's aunt one morning went for a walk and came home and said, well, I was walking and this couple said hi, and it was Sylvester Stallone and his wife. Because of course, the Borghese are not, they're rich, but they still feel the need to rent out this villa and you can imagine what kind of money you have to pay for even a single day in a villa built in the 1570s, which is pretty much pristine, okay? So, we know, and Machiavelli knew very well, that the Medici loved hunting, that among other things they love hunting birds. So you find some affinity that is being suggested there. On top of that, though, you find the details of Machiavelli overloaded with these bird traps, working at the hunting by himself. What's the meaning of that? Clearly that he can work that he doesn't find it beneath him to engage in strenuous physical activity to achieve his goals, okay? So you don't find a minor aristocrat as Machiavelli was just relying on servants for these menial tasks, but someone who's man enough to do everything himself, okay? So you start, you start getting what I'm trying to suggest. In, a following, in the following section, we find Machiavelli overseeing the cutting and then handling the selling of the wood, of the wood from, from the woods on, on his property, having to argue about the price, uh, uh, about the money, with people coming from Florence to buy to the point where the argument is so strenuous, so strong, so heated that he has to invoke the mediation, the arbitration of the local priest. 
who was a cousin, had the last name of Machiavelli. Again, if this is to be considered a resume, you find someone in a supervisory role and someone who can handle complex matters even when they involve triangulation because a third party, a mediator, has to be brought in. So clearly in here, whereas for the first episode you need some reconstruction of the historical backgrounds, for the second section it's immediately evident how this, how the skills deployed by Machiavelli there can be considered similar to skills that would be required to handle a diplomatic or a political crisis. Then you have the first reading. First, because there is also the evening reading. This is the afternoon reading, then there is the evening reading. And by the way, you find reference to dinner. Don't be fooled by that. You find that after dinner, Machiavelli is going to the village, etc. That's not really dinner. It's what, to this day, even my parents would call desinare, which is a typical Italian word. It is the main meal of the day. And it's been translated as dinner, as an approximate uh, word to make you understand that you eat a lot. But clearly, you wake up very early in the countryside, you have breakfast, then you have a snack that is almost a lunch midway through the morning, and you have this kind of dinner at an hour that could be 3 p.m., right? And that's why he has time to go to the village and then he talks about evening reading, right? Because it's not what you would call supper at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., okay? So first reading, he goes for a walk, he finds a good natural, nice natural setting, he reads poetry, he reads the classics. So what is this about? Yes, it is a form of entertainment and relaxation, but it's also feeding the spirit, right? It's a kind of spiritual entertainment because you have the great classical author. And it's also a form of learning, generic or general learning, because the assumption within the humanities of the period Machiavelli was indeed also a humanist, his father was a humanist, was that you read these classical texts, even those that are considered literature, to learn about human nature in general. So there is an educational goal and there is a, an impact, a positive impact, on your knowledge of men and the world. It is not surprising, therefore, that as for this first reading, you find Machiavelli going to the village because you go from spiritual learning, spiritual education, feeding the spirit, to experiential, empirical learning. He goes to the village to see what is going on, to learn about individual men, specific cases in the village, or cases that would be told by people going through the village, walking or using their rides, horses, donkeys, to continue and get to Florence. So there you see him observe men and gaining practical expertise, empirical knowledge of the world. Then you'll find him playing cards, playing cards with the villagers, and of course, uh, they're very rowdy, they, they scream, uh, as you would have found in a bar 50 years ago, and, and you might even find it now people playing cards, being very passionate about their game and about winning, arguing, because with some of those play games, uh, you have four players, but you may have two versus two, and of course the two players in a, play of, 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 in a game of cards are not supposed to communicate. Yes, there are secret signals you can establish with your partner. However, you're not supposed to communicate and then you argue not with the competitors, you argue with your companion who didn't understand the kind of tactic, the kind of game, the kind of cards you had in mind to play. So what is this about, if this is to be considered a resume? Machiavelli being familiar with chance playing a role in all human affairs, because Machiavelli was big on that theme, which we will find in the final chapters of The Prince, that after all, 
even a good leader, even a strong individual will not have, will never have complete control over the entropy of reality. There is always something that you cannot control, okay? So just to move from that to politics, you may be the best possible leader and the strongest and still be killed by a random killer, by a crazy guy, unless you want to consider, for example, Oswald as someone who was sent there by the Russians, okay? Uh, and Machiavelli being passionate about the game means he's passionate about winning. He cares about winning. Then we have the second reading. And this is the most important. This is what introduces the reference to the prince. The second reading is chock full of metaphors. And those metaphors are really intellectual models. Machiavelli tells you that for this reading, he's dressing up that he cannot go there with his muddy clothes because he's been outside all day, that he has to be dressed elegantly because he enters into a dialogue with the big men of antiquity, with the leaders, with the kings, the princes, the generals, the military generals of the past, and entertains a conversation. He asks them questions, they answer those questions. And again, you have this metaphor of questioning the dialogue being a Q&A kind of session. Finally, another important relevant metaphor is that this is the food for his mind. The real food, the real nutrition is this kind of reading. So you understand that this is about knowledge. However, I wouldn't really use knowledge or just the term knowledge because it is so generic, I would suggests that this is about gaining expertise. Why? Because the same way that we saw that Machiavelli is driven in his political analysis by the analysis of the context of the particular, particular uh, circumstances of a context or ecosystem, in here as well, he's not just opening the book and memorizing what he reads. He comes dressed up meaning he comes in in his role as a former politician, diplomat, high-ranking administrator. He comes in, therefore, the dress is his mindset. So he's not a generic reader getting generic knowledge out of those books. He's an informed, experienced kind of reader who wants to get out of those books specific kind of information that would further his expertise that can be applied to his future political career when he will once again have one, which will happen during the 1520s, although not really to his satisfaction because the missions given to him were minor, not, not really relevant in the context of the big politics of Florence. So why the dialogue? Once again, because I'm reading with some questions in mind. What are the solutions to the current problems of Florence or to the problems Florence might face in the future when he is once again employed? Which alludes to the possibility that reading is a multiple act, that there isn't one reading of a text, but there should be multiple readings depending on the problems. Because when you have new questions, what do you do? You open the book again. And you find the answer to the new questions you have, which is something Machiavelli had done during a famous diplomatic mission, 1502. He's being sent to the court of Cesare Borgia, who was the son of Pope Alexander VI, was also a powerful and cruel military leader who had put together a small kingdom northeast of Florence, and Florence was really across the Apennine. So the goal of the mission was, please, Messer Machiavelli, find out if Cesare Borgia will soon be descending those mountains and attacking the city of Florence. Because not only has a sizable army, but he's considered to be a military genius. So how can we prepare? We need to prepare in advance to resist this kind of attack. Machiavelli goes there and he fails miserably. He's recalled 
within a few months because the information he sends back is insufficient. They, they cannot really, after months of daily, almost daily reports, the government of Florence cannot make up whether Cesare Borgia will attack them. Keep in mind, this is the fall, right? Late fall, early uh, uh, winter, and when is that you attack? Usually in March or April, right? That's when the wars of the past would uh, have their inception, right? You attack usually with the good weather. There are exceptions, right? You, you can exactly attack during the bad weather season because they wouldn't expect it. But normally, in, in the mindset of those Florentine govern, uh, leaders who sent Machiavelli, they would say, we need to know whether he'll attack, he, Cesare Borgia, will attack Florence in March or April. But in order to get ready, we need to start preparation in January or, or earlier on, right? So what, does it, what did he do, Machiavelli, in 1502? He sent a letter to a friend, Biagio, saying, can you send me these two books? And one of the books, they're both history books, and one of the books is historical in a, in a loose sense, is the lives of Plutarch. Plutarch was a Greek historian who wrote chapters about the lives of great leaders of the past. What is Machiavelli trying to do? He's trying to ask the question and get the answer from that particular book. The question would be, I don't understand Cesare Borgia even though I see him every day. Maybe I'll understand him better if I find the match in this book. Of all these dozens of leaders that are described, whose lives are described in, in this collection by Plutarch, whom does he resemble the most? And if I find a few clues that give him his political profile, then I can read about that particular leader and understand the secret sides, the dark sides of Cesare Borgia that I'm not able to see. And that is, in practice, what Machiavelli was doing 10 years before this letter, using a book that he knew, that he had read, but needed to review and reread again because he had new questions. And this, at this time, the question was, does any of these leaders remind me of Cesare Borgia? And if so, I can read the rest of the profile and then predict his action. Okay? Very interesting. Then he says, reading is nothing if you don't write. Because it's about reinforcing your memory. It's about deeper learning when you write what you learn. And of course, he's writing the Principatibus, the book about principles. This segues into one of the final sections saying, will I be able to work again? And then you understand the goal, the, the, the goal, the objective Machiavelli had in mind with this lecture. And he's saying, first he's saying, I don't know how when this book is complete, how shall I give it? Whom shall I give it to? Because he wants the Medici to read the book and the book will be a capstone of his new career because It'll be his portfolio, the gem in his portfolio. Someone who's written this book should be employed again by any government. And then he completes uh, page 136 uh, with the reference to doing anything, even voltolare un sassolino, which means even turning a little stone would be enough for me. Meaning, I don't care if I don't go back to a higher level position as long as I'm involved with politics. This is how much I care, okay? Any questions that would be uh, the analysis of the letter? Read the letter if you've read it already. Give it a second look with this in mind. Now let's talk about Bob and Mary. I posted a reading. It was one of the assigned reading from this book, What Would Machiavelli Do?, which sold well enough in the late 1990s and early 2000s, about a few hundreds of thousands of copies of this book, even though it's a very simplistic book. It's one of those that you might want to consider for your paper, and your paper would be, when I read this book, when I find in this book references to the name of Machiavelli, what is the foundation for those references or the Machiavellian ideas? Do I find anything in the prints 
that inspired a page or a reference in this book. And if I do, is the book reading in a faithful way uh, the book of the prince or is there a distortion, a misinterpretation by the author that is to say, having studied the prince within this course, can I say that Machiavelli was trying to say something different, something more complex, for example, not just saying like Bing would say, you have to go back to the state of a kid. What would a small kid, little kid do? They would lie, cheat, take what they want, and not really feel guilty about it because they don't have much of a conscience. You do the same. And we tried to say, well, what kind of intellectual work was really done by Machiavelli if it boils down to do whatever you feel like in order to, uh, to, to get what you want. Of course, as I said, we'll talk about the various stages for the paper. For example, one essential part would be to collect information about the author. If there are interviews where the author is talking about his inspiration or his ideas about Machiavelli, that will help us understand the book itself. Include that. Look at the reviews that you can find in digital archives of newspapers and magazines. See if you can find any review that criticized, made a critique of the Machiavellian content. And that is what you're doing yourself. You are, the, the core of your paper would be a critique of the Machiavellian nature, of the Machiavellian references included in this book. Or, or the, the spirit, the Machiavellian spirit of the whole book. Now, in the introduction, page Roman numeral 17 and following, we find the first story, and is, it is the first story, the story of a young manager named Bob and his secretary, Mary. And you can read everything, you're supposed to read everything, and remember, I'll just summarize it in order to go more quickly, Bob, feels tired, would like to go and play golf during the weekend. Unfortunately, a big project is due, a big report is due on Monday. He knows that Mary, his assistant, has planned a vacation and she has already paid for uh, the vacation. However, in the end, he decides that it is more important for him to get the relaxation, the rest uh, that he finds in playing golf, and decides to ignore blatantly, pretends not to know that Mary not only has this vacation coming, but has purchased tickets, paid the money for the vacation, and he dumps the completion of the report on Mary's shoulder, and of course, Mary will uh, play along and complete the work and cancel her vacation. Okay? So, the, the conclusion of the book is be Machiavellian. That it's best to be Machiavelli, that Machiavelli would have done what Bob did. He had a goal, get rest, relax, recharge, during a difficult period, and he manages to control the situation and achieve the goal uh, by leveraging his authority over the secretary at the expense of his secretary's time, energies, and, and she had to sacrifice, she had to give up on the application. So keep in mind what we said about power, so we, this is the basic, before, earlier, I, I put on the board a much more complicated schema. This is, these are the basic elements. Power means control. Control of what? Control of the outcome. Control of people in the context is secondary, right? Control means to gain, maintain, or increase your control over the outcome. And you can achieve this kind of control using, either by using force or by using influence. So force would be direct control, right? And influence will be indirect control. So direct control would be 
I point a gun at you, and then I tell you to do something. Indirect control influence would be I talk you into doing something just by using my words. No threats, even in my language. I just present an argument that is convincing enough or deceiving enough. However, for this gain to be classified as a Machiavellian gain, it has to be repeatable. <coughs> repeatable may have different meanings. Repeatable by the same person or by different persons in the same situation, etc. The outcome has to be predictable. So I'm not certain I will get what I want, but there is a good chance, a good probability, right? Probability numbers are in my favor. And there is, it's, you need to find the element of necessity for this to be a, a Machiavellian game. Why has this has to have the element of necessity? Because with ignoring that, you would be ignoring the costs of the deployment of a strategy, okay? And this is something we need to do in the case of Bob as well. What are the costs uh, that he incurred? And costs can be material resources, even money is a material resource, or costs in terms of what do you lose? You might lose some of your power, or this might affect another element that is key in Machiavelli's examination of leadership, the image, right? If you damage your image, then you lose some of your influence, right? So, and of course, you have to place this in a context. You have to examine the context. And just as a reminder, there are three main kind of contests. You may have a contest that is open or partially open, oftentimes, it's a porous kind of context. It's not completely closed or completely open. The context may be closed. And again, when I'm talking about open or closed, it's still subject to time and space. I'm saying that within the time of this behavior, practice, strategy, and within the space where the strategy is deployed, the context can be called as such open or partially open, closed or enclosed. Because once the game is over, then the context disappears, even though you still belong to a kind of ecosystem where there are various contexts and various games, right? For example, in this case, the ecosystem of Bob and Mary is their office, their company, the corporation they both work for, right? So keep in mind that as well. Ecosystem means also looking at skills of the players in involved, and it's dynamic, meaning that it's a process. It's never ending, right? For example, you may have complete control in a context, but is your power in the ecosystem going up or down based on the game you play? Because the, play the game you play in the context affects the ecosystem, right? Enclosed would be a context that is looks, appears to be closed, but it's, a, it's strongly connected to another context. So whatever Bob does with Mary at work can be something between the two of them, but it's not just between the two of them because they both work for a larger office or for a larger company, okay? So it's something that appears to be closed, but it, it, it's not just about that perspective. So, clearly, Bob is not Machiavellian. Bob is a loser, a Machiavellian loser. Bob is an a-hole, right? Anyone can reach that conclusion within the second page by the end of the episode. But in Machiavellian terms, what kind of power has Bob deployed? Influence, right? He's not threatening with Mary with violence is not even using really the threat of termination, right? However, the result of the deployment of his influence, the pressure he puts on Mary, generates what in terms of power? Go back to the terminology 
that you found in the scene of a Bronx tale with Charles Palminteri playing the part of the mafioso and explaining about leadership. <clears throat> what is the result of this influence? In, I'm referring to the, yeah. Keep her in, his uh, image in her eyes. I'm sorry? He's pointing his image in her eyes, in Mary's eyes. Okay, but go back to the scene with Charles Palminteri. He's talking about what? Availability in one segment of the dialogue, in another he's talking about what? Better to be feared than love. Love and fear, right? So, which are terms from the famous chapter in Machiavelli. So, as a result of uh, Bob's deployment of influence, he's using what within this dichotomy? He's not using love, right? He's not saying, oh, please marry, you know that I need so, to, to play golf so much, etc. He's using fear, right? That is his leverage. Mary will do it because she's afraid of getting fired. Clearly. Okay? No doubt. You would do the same in the same situation. Cancel your vacation, etc. However, when we read, when I read from the chapter where Machiavelli says, is it better to be loved or to be feared? It says, well, it would be nice to be loved, but love doesn't come with a lot of control and fear gives you more control. However, you have to be careful because fear can turn into what? Do you remember? Yes, Nigel. Hatred, Hatred right? Mm -hmm. And is this something that is happening to Bob? So he's used his influence successfully, right? He got what he wanted. He controlled the outcome, the report was generated because he had absolute control over Mary the assistant, the secretary. However, in terms of the context of the office, in terms of the ecosystem, is Mary loving? Of course, she's not loving, but admiring, appreciating, respecting her boss more? No, of course not, right? She's hating Bob. She's hating Bob's cats, right? Wouldn't you do the same? You would do the work because you have to, but wouldn't you in that context repeat throughout the weekend while writing the report, I hate this guy, right? Absolutely normal. And what happens when love becomes hate, when fear actually becomes hate? The image is damaged, right? She might go out in the office talking to other people about him and telling others how much of an a-hole Bob is. And therefore, the next time Bob will try to use his influence, his influence will be decreased, diminished, right? By deploying this game, he's decreasing the amount of influence he can use in the office, right? Or in order to regain that influence, he needs to incur in costs. So, is the outcome repeatable? Yes, to an extent, right? Because the more you repeat this kind of strategy, the more you lose power control because your image is tarnished and you have less and less influence. Of course, word will go around that Bob is not a good boss because he's exploiting his employees and if the employees are not motivated, the company will not be productive, which is very much Machiavelli's concern because he has this more modern view of society. He's not saying, well, you're the prince, you can do whatever you want. You're like a modern dictator. No, he's saying, careful, because your actions and your image will affect the productivity of the citizens because the citizens have to have some kind of confidence in their leader. If they only have fear, <clears throat> then they will not be motivated to work hard, invest, commit time and resources to economic growth. Without economic growth in a society, then how can you pay for the costs of whatever strategy you need to deploy at some point for a cry, for, in, in order to uh, control the context? You need material resources, right? And those resources will be paid by the productivity of uh, your subjects. In this case, Mary 
would eventually, wouldn't you say, Mary would eventually find another job? If not, between, before that, report on Bob, right? So, yeah, it's repeatable, it's predictable, but every time you deploy that <coughs> strategy, you incur in higher costs. Your image is affected, the amount of power, if your power relies on influence, is uh, reduced, the uh, uh, bad stories, the rumors about Bob and his poor treatment of his employees and his laziness will go around, he will not be considered for a promotion, right? So that's why Machiavelli, Bob is not really Machiavellian, he's just a loser who's exploiting the power and authority that he has in his hands. Wouldn't you say? Any questions about this? Trying to go quickly enough to introduce at least this last topic and then I can continue on pride. The important thing is that you understand these terms and how they apply differently to different kinds of situation. And just to add a few more examples to further your understanding of the various sides of power and control. Imagine a bar, a crowded bar. There is a drunk man, and the drunk bumps into someone who's dressed elegantly. And this man is a police detective, okay? And the drunk has bumped into him, but would like to get into a fight, right? You know how drunks are. He's responsible for bumping, but he would like to escalate that to a fight. So what are the resources that the police detective can deploy in order to control the situation and achieve and control the outcome, that is to say, avoid the fight. So if he has one of those badges that can be put on your belt, right, he can just, let me do the scene. Let's do theater, okay? You need an angry drunk? <laughs> oh yes, please. Do we have any whiskey? <laughs> so, so if we knew, we wouldn't tell you. <laughs> no, because I was thinking the same thing before. I was eating a prosciutto sandwich and I said, where's the red wine? Can really have prosciutto with water? Ooh. Okay, so here's this feisty, aggressive, drunk guy, right? And he's about to attack me and I flush my badge. I just do this, and he sees, right? He sees the badge, he sees I'm a policeman. And he stops, right? Hopefully he stops. <laughs> wait, wait there though, because this is just one scenario. So what have I used in, in this kind of scenario? At the moment? Influence, right? Pure influence. Because I haven't said anything, haven't done anything, just the symbol should be enough to control the situation in other instances. Let's say he's still coming at me or I see in his eyes that he's not <laughs> at peace yet. What if I open my jacket and I have a holster with my gun in here, right? What would that be? And hopefully he'll stop. If he didn't stop earlier, he'll stop now because he sees the butt <laughs> of my, of my handgun of my 38 special. I'd rather be in the 1970s than have a Glock in this scene. Okay, so it's not exactly influence, right? It's not influence anymore because I'm showing the gun and that is more than influence. What do you call? I didn't put that on the board today, but I did it last time. What would you call that? Oh, sorry. No, there is a term that I put on the side of force which is related to influence, but it's a form of influence that relies on the existence of a gun. Right? Think of every state in the world keeps an army. They, most of them, never go to war. Why do they keep an army? <laughs> to avoid being attacked, and that would be deterrence. deterrence. Okay? Deterrence is influence, yes, because I haven't used my gun, but it's 
do not like influence because influence doesn't need any weapon, right? I can just talk to you and get my result. Deterrence needs to imply that force is available, okay? And the last thing, oh, okay, I got my result, the drunk has gone away. The last thing is I pull my gun out. Now, even if I don't shoot Lewis, Please don't. it's still force. Because I have pulled the gun, and in fact, in many states, in the United States and other countries in the world, whenever a policeman takes the gun out, they have to write a special report. That they cannot just use it willy-nilly. Okay, because of course, there are costs to society in terms of the image of the police, et cetera, and, and, that, and, and there are institutions that want to limit that. So even if I don't shoot, once the gun is out, then it, that is, in fact, force. Thank you. I will continue on Friday with the last part. And as usual, you find here the attendance sheet.